Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's session. My name is Mary Catherine Arnold, and I am a part of the Career Services team at, here at South University. Um, I want to welcome you to tonight's session. I will be stepping in tonight for Kim Bevington, who is our QEP Academic Success Center Manager, as she has been out of the office. Tonight's event is being brought to you by the College of Nursing as a part of the QEP Keeping It Real Classroom to Career Co-Curricular Event Series, and this event will be recorded. Now, you as participants, other than our guest speaker, will be muted for the presentation, but you can feel free to type questions into the chat box at any point in time during, this, during tonight's session, and these will be addressed either throughout the presentation or at the end. So again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. South University is very excited to have Dr. Kim Keebler. Dr. Hebler is a medical graduate from Emory University School of Nursing and Doctor of Nurse, Nursing Practice and Vanderbilt University. Dr. Hebler has over two decades of palliative and chronic disease management experience, specializing in the aspects of disease, symptoms, and self-management for patients living with multiple chronic conditions. To name only a few of our accomplishments, Dr. Keebler was appointed to the Michigan Governor's Commission for End-of-Life Care Legislation and held two appointments to the Medicare Evidence Advisory Committee through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And she is a selected May Day Pain Fellow from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, in New York. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Keebler presenting today, so please enjoy um, please enjoy today's presentation. Dr. Kibler, Kibler, I will be giving you audio controls. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you for the introduction. And um, you're going to be pushing the slides forward, so I'll just say next slide. So uh, this presentation is about the changes that are happening, um, not only in the United States, but across the globe as we look at an aging population. And I'm also going to talk about some of the changes in the demographics of the patient population that uh, we can expect to see in U.S. healthcare. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, in March of this year, uh, and go back, I think when you push the slides it goes slower than my end. There we go. So in, just a couple months ago, uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the National Institutes of Health, the National Institutes of Aging, the U.S. Census Bureau and the U.S. Department of Commerce, Economics, and Statistics Administration released a 300-page report on the aging world. Uh, this report is an amazing uh, collection of what to expect, and if anybody is looking at doing research or studying uh, the aging population, this is a great reference to, uh, to look at. So a lot of these slides are taking, taken directly from uh, information from this report as we look at what the demographic patient population is going to look like over the next uh, 30 years. Next slide. So the developed world's population is obviously aging rapidly, just like we see in the United States. And currently, um, for older population, those that are 65 years and older represent about 7% or more of the total population in many parts of the world. And the growth of the world's older population will continue to outpace that of younger population over the next 35 years. Next slide. In 2015, last year, uh, there were 7.3 billion people worldwide, and this is almost at 9% or 617 million people aged 65 and older. I always like to think about population from demographics that I understand, and having lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and the fast growth in Atlanta was just absolutely crazy. So if you think about 617 million, that's like the size of 88 Atlantas. Uh, across the country of people that are 65, or across the globe of people that are 65 years and older. 
and the number of older people worldwide is, ex is projected to increase more than 60% over the next 15 years. And just think about that, 60% uh, growth in worldwide population of uh, people that are 65 years and older. That is a tremendous uh, escalation of a population. And in 2030, there will be about 1 billion older people globally, and that's equivalent to about 12% of the total uh, population worldwide. Next slide. The majority of the older population will continue to age over the next 20 years, and in 2050, there will be about 1.6 billion older people globally. That represents almost 16.8% of the total world population, or 9.4 billion people, a lot of people. This average increase is equivalent to 27 million older people between 2015 and 2015. And 2050 in the United States is about where the population begins to taper off. Next slide. The oldest segment of the world's population is growing very fast, much faster than the younger segment. And, and that's because we're living longer because we have better pharmaceutical agents. Uh, we know how to take care of diseases a lot better than we did 20, 30 years ago. I mean, just the, the fact that statin therapy alone is totally eradicated uh, the stroke uh, prevalence like we used to see in the 60s and 70s, we hardly see that anymore. Uh, worldwide, the population of people age 80 and over, older is projected to more than triple between 2015 and 2050. When I first started um, practicing as a nurse in the early 80s, it was unheard of to have an 80-year-old patient. And now, you know, we see patients in their 80s and 90s and approaching 100 years old more than we ever have. So this is pr projected to triple between 2015 and 2050 from about 126 or 127 million people, um, I lost my last statistic there, but to a huge, uh, there we go, almost to 445 uh, or 47 million people worldwide. Thank you. Between 1980 to 210, the U.S. Census data showed that the 90 and older population almost tripled when compared to a doubling of the population aged 65 to 89. And part of that uh, increase in growth is why the Affordable Care Act is uh, kicked off. And if we look at in 2010, um, that is when the Affordable Care Act started. So centurions or older people than 100 years old are, have increased almost 66% in the U.S. during the same period of time. Next slide. The aged people in the U.S. are very different than other populations uh, in other socio-demographic characteristics. And if you look at this report, what's interesting is that the majority of countries spend a lot of resources on the social determinants of um, aging, food, housing, transportation, support systems within the community, which is very different than the U.S. We're, worldwide, we spend less on social, su social supports than any other country. The U.S. population has more chronic conditions, and that requires long-term care. It consumes public resources disproportionately and creates a heavier burden on informal caregivers, which are provided by families. And if anyone is interested, there's a national initiative that's ongoing right now trying to get uh, caregiver support on uh, platforms for state platforms for voting across the country. Next slide. The changes occurring in the social structures of aging in most parts of the world have contributed to a growing number of older people with multiple health conditions and health conditions that interfere with physical functioning and the ability to carry out activities of daily living. And if we think about the number one quality uh, indicator of life, number one quality indicator of life is physical functioning. And when people are unable to carry out their activities of daily living, that's when we begin to look at changes in a care plan, for an example. Somebody who has heart failure and is no longer able to uh, get into the shower, for an example. We need to you know, change the way that we're approaching that patient within the home Next slide. The United States itself is in the midst of a major demographic, demographic shift, and over the next four decades, people aged 65 and older will make up the largest percentage of the U.S. population, and that's why we're making so many changes to Medicare, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that 
uh, as we move forward. Next slide. The oldest of the 80 million baby boomers reached 65 in 2011. We are living longer, but we're also living longer with increased disability. I just read some uh, statistics the other day that uh, people that are 65 and older are over 35 to 38 percent obese, and you know all of the complications that occur with obesity, for an example. So multiple chronic conditions is a huge initiative at the federal level. This is also um, in part of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services, along with the CDC and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 2010, at the same year that the Affordable Care Act started, initiated a strategic framework on multiple chronic conditions. And partly because in patients who are 65 years and older, three out of four of them have a multiple chronic condition. So if you think about the patient sitting in a, in a waiting room in a primary care setting, you have four patients and three of them have more than one chronic condition. And two out of three Medicare beneficiaries are known to have um, multiple chronic conditions. These patients are at risk for increased morbidity, the symptoms that are associated with these conditions, as well as mortality, early death, as a result of the concomitant burden of disease and symptoms which obviously contribute to poor, poorer day-to-day -day functioning or the ability to carry out activities of daily living. Multiple chronic conditions account for substantial health care costs in the United States, as you can imagine, and this is one of the reasons why the Affordable Care Act is looking at why are we spending a lot of money doing what we're doing when we're not really improving uh, Americans' uh, quality of life. Currently, 66% of the total health care spending is associated with a care for over one in four Americans. So think about it. 25% of U.S. health care spending is spent in patients uh, who have multiple chronic conditions. That's a lot of money going to uh, very few people in the United States. Next slide. This is a chart that comes from the uh, Centers of Medicare Medicaid um, chart book. Uh, this is how they determine chronic conditions. They looked at, they looked at millions of uh, fee-for-service uh, patients uh, with Medicare, identified some of the common chronic conditions. You can see here depression, cancer, osteoporosis, hypertension. But the number one cause of disease and disability in the United States is heart failure followed by malignancy and then COPD, although the CDC announced this year that medical errors actually took the place of CDC and uh, medical errors in the United States are accounting for the third leading cause of death in adults, another reason for us to be using uh, evidence-based guidelines to ensure that we're doing the right things. Um, but if you look here, I mean, if there's more than six conditions at a time for any one of these diseases, is pretty prevalent in the Medicare patient population. Next slide. America in this uh, international population report uh, was termed a very interesting term, which I, I think is uh, something interesting to use as we talk to patients about their own health or even look at our own health. I always tell my nurse practitioner students, you know, make sure that you have a normal BMI if you're going to talk to patients about BMI and you're not smoking and you're eating appropriately, right? We have to be the role models of the health that we want to promote in the, in the United States. So America is identified as the American wealth health paradox. We're one of the healthiest, or one of the, excuse me, one of the wealthiest uh, countries worldwide, but we're certainly uh, not the healthiest. Smoking, obesity, and hypertension continue to contribute to the increase in female mortality over men, and part of that is because women are living longer than men, but women are actually more unhealthier than men, and we look at Medicare uh, uh, patient uh, demographics. And the American men and women who are living in the poorer southern states have lower health life expectancy than elsewhere in the U.S. And you've heard of the stroke belt, uh, the high incidence of hypertension and um, high blood pressure, um, heart failure and diabetes in the southeast. Next slide. I like this uh, slide because it shows, you know, the escalation. 50, I mentioned that you know America is going to be aging exponentially up to 2050. Right now, 10 million baby boomers are entering into Medicare every day. And if we continue to spend the kind of money that we've been spending on health care 
for patients with multiple chronic conditions, we cannot sustain ourselves with a population that's contributing less to the Medicare dollars and another population who's demanding those resources. So you can see here the reason why we have to start looking at the expenses in healthcare in the United States and changing our models of care as we approach this growing and escalating patient population. Next slide. I've been talking about the Affordable Care Act and it's interesting, you know, we're going six years into it now um, and with the uh, election uh, close at hand and it seems to be a hot button uh, for the for, um, politicians, you know, their platform of discussion. Um, but the billions and billions and billions of dollars that have gone into the Affordable Care Act is absolutely amazing to me. I study this stuff every day and what's unfolding at incremental rates is, is just amazing. I mean, we had three major reports that just came out last week and I'll be talking a little bit about that. But, you know, at first, and everybody is, you know, un, up in the air about what does this mean to our practice, how do we practice, we prepare, um, but if we're not moving forward in the requirements that are um, mandated by us for those providers who are billing Medicare and soon Medicaid and third-party payers are supposed to follow the model in 2020, uh, we will be left behind in uh, our reimbursement efforts to take care of the Medicare and Medicaid patient population. Next slide. Title IV of the Affordable Care Act is specifically targeting chronic disease in the United States and improving public health. And for those of you who are working and wanting to work in this area of health care, there's certainly going to be lots of uh, opportunity to make a difference and improve the lives of many Americans in your communities. Next slide. The most frequent use of healthcare resources right now in the United States are chronic exacerbations of chronic diseases, uh, congestive heart failure, or heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, and these two diseases were the first two diseases on the penalty, the 30-day penalty uh, for readmission in hospitals who are um, receiving Medicare reimbursement. Now there's a lot more uh, diseases that have been added to that list. But our goal of the penalty um, purposes is to make sure that patients are self-managed, that they understand how to take care of their symptoms when they're in the home. They recognize early, earlier symptoms versus later symptoms that are taking them in and out of hospital. So basically, poorly managed disease and symptoms do contribute to exacerbations and lead to increased hospital admissions. Next slide. My work is looking at symptoms and concomitant diseases and how that interfaces with patient quality of life. So we know that with a prolonged course of illness and disability that occurs for multiple chronic conditions, these patients also have concomitant symptoms such as pain, depression, dyspnea, and fatigue. And it's those poorly managed symptoms or those symptoms that go unevaluated or unassessed and non-treated that actually contribute to exacerbations in disease. I saw a patient today, for an example, I see patients in chronic pain and patients who are depressed and I, and I tell them, I can't take care of your pain unless I take care of your depression because we know that depression exacerbates pain. So it's understanding those symptoms and how they interrelate to each other and how to manage them so that the, the disease itself is not not uh, debilitating and creating the burdens that are associated with poorly managed symptoms. Next slide. And as I just mentioned, if symptoms are undertreated, they obviously lead to a decrease in quality of life. They increase the disease exacerbations. I think about the COPD patient all of a sudden starts having a lot more mucus secretion, is coughing a lot more, and then, you know, is starting to, to have problems with breathing. You know that that patient is probably, at, you know, leading towards an exacerbation. So if we stop the symptoms sooner and treat them and, and teach patients how to effectively manage their, patient, their disease at home through self-management and they engage in that, they will have better outcomes. They won't be going in and out of hospital. Next slide. This is a uh, slide that just shows how COPD and uh, COP, 
COPD and heart failure, for an example, each time a patient has an exacerbation, they actually are headed more towards their mortality, right? So each time they have an exacerbation, it leads, it increases their, their poor prognosis and eventually leads to death. And what's interesting about patients and families who are living with these diseases and they're so used to mom and dad going in and out of hospital, Everyone thinks that they're going to rally. They're just going to rally uh, the next day. But this is different than cancer. Cancer is very predictable. We know when somebody's going to die with cancer. Very, there's a very sleep, steep slope uh, from you know physical functioning to prognosis. But in the COPD patients or um, chronic kidney, renal disease patients, you know anyone that has a chronic condition with exacerbations, they eventually one day they just don't get up and and they you know they die suddenly. So it's very different. And, and when you think about this kind of a disease trajectory versus cancer. And that's why it's so important. Once somebody's diagnosed with heart failure, they have an ejection fraction less than 40%, or somebody with COPD with an FEV of less than 70% predicted, that's need to start talking about advanced uh, directives and preparing uh, different care plans for these patients as they approach the end of their life and keep them out of hospital. Next slide. This is a trajectory of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Again, another diagnosis that's difficult to prognosticate. These patients just dwindle for a very long time before, uh, before mortality. Next slide. So in 2012, the National Quality Forum, uh, the quality measures, this is where all the quality measures are developed in the United States. And for people who are currently participating in patient quality reporting systems, this is where the measures come in the certified electronic medical records. There's over 300 measures that are there, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a few minutes. But what's interesting in 2012 is that uh, the National Quality Forum separated palliative care from end-of-life care. And if we look at palliative care, palliative care is actually symptom management, and palliative care should actually be concomitant with chronic conditions if we want to manage symptoms and keep patients comfortable and at home and functional. So palliative care should always be considered uh, sooner in the course of disease rather than at the end of life. So the, you know, s synonymously thinking that palliative care is end of life care is no longer uh, an appropriate assumption in, since, you know, I guess we're four years into it now where palliative care is actually separated uh, from hospice and end of life care. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the National Quality Forum is home for all of the endorsed quality measures for primary care providers and specialists who receive Medicare payment. Uh, there used to be, we needed to have nine of these measures. Now with the uh, new macro legislation, which is still up for public comment, we only need to have eight of these measures. And as I mentioned, they are embedded in a certified meaningful use electronic health record and the measures are used to determine the value from the providers. So right now, MDs, NPs, PAs, and nurse anesthetists are evaluated for their patient care. I mentioned the uh, patient quality reporting system, which began in March of this year. So pre providers, practices, systems, organizations, if they haven't been doing this, will be penalized for not submitting quality measures. Next slide. So the, in 2013, the Federal Register identified the chronic care model. It, this is an incentive for primary care providers. They get uh, extra money. They have to uh, make sure that they're offering 24-7 uh, services to patients with chronic conditions. And the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research has actually endorsed the quality measures that are used, has provided tools, support mechanisms, measurable objectives, um, provide information on the regulations and how we determine quality. And the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research is where all of the guidelines come from. I actually had a um, logo here, but because of compliance reasons, they took it out. But uh, Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research should be everyone's best friend when it comes to learning where standard of care practices are in the United States based on the evidence-based guidelines. Next slide. 
So the chronic care management uh, typically includes a patient-centered care plan. And for nurses, we're used to care plans. We grew up with care plans. And now with the Affordable Care Act, everybody's going back to uh, care plans that are individualized and focused on specific patient-centered outcomes for that specific patient. Um, but the problem list should include the expected outcomes and prognosis and measurable treatment goals. And I always push my uh, graduate students to write measurable objectives. And the reason is we have to be able to quantify exactly what it is that we do for that patient. Symptom management is a huge initiative uh, as part of the chronic care management incentives, um, including preventative care. Actually, Medicare reimburses primary care providers now for preventative care. They didn't used to do that. Um, we have to identify the community and social services that are being used for patients with chronic care, whether they're getting meals on wheels, whether they're getting services for the aging, for an example. Uh, we have to identify medication management, the responsible individual for it, different interventions. And again, this is an interdisciplinary approach to patients, trying to keep patients at home uh, within a primary care setting, using the primary care practice to manage and coordinate uh, patients' care versus having multiple different providers and or home services or hospice. This is an opportunity for primary care providers to, deter, to demonstrate a very uh, um, transparent and coordinated uh, approach to their patient care. Uh, Medicare requires that they have periodic reviews and revisions to the care plans uh, for reimbursement on this uh, uh, incentive. Next slide. I'm going to let you just click all the way through. There we go. So the chronic care metal model the incentive that Medicare is currently offering. It's a uh, ICD-9 code. Uh, it's a way of geriatricizing medical care in a way. It provides continuity of care. It's reliable. It's 24-7 and it should go all the way from chronic illness to death. Uh, again, self-management is a really important concept uh, with the Affordable Care Act and patient-centered outcomes, empowering patients uh, to manage their own chronic conditions at home. Uh, it's also respecting and including families and other caregivers. Um, it's trying to reduce the burden of medical care by managing patients at home, reducing exacerbations, maintaining physical functioning, for an example. Um, this is all community-based. This is the movement at, away from acute care. So we've all been trained in acute care, but the new move is into community and back into the home and uh, community-based uh, providers. And I did a uh, um, little fellowship at um, with the World Health Organization's palliative care program in Oxford, England with Macmillan nurses, with community providers and Macmillan, everything there was community-based. And I, I see a lot of our practices now beginning to move into that area to be um, more community and home uh, focused. To prevent falls and wrong actions within the homes, once you're in the home you can see the things that maybe uh, could contribute to accidents for patients and you're able to make changes. Uh, it allows uh, um, patients and families to enhance the relationships, activities, and meaningfulness, and it is during uh, with patients who are living with dementia. Next slide. So steps in an optimal care planning within the um, chronic care model, you have to target specifically what your measurements are. Um, and provide current uh, patient family situation, identify likely situations, you know, who's involved, what are the needs in the family, um, prioritize hopes and fears, values and goals, uh, and it should be patient driven. The patient and family are at the center of determining a, a care plan. The healthcare provider is not the one who's directing this. The healthcare provider is the one who's empowering and supporting uh, the development of the care plan. Um, it's available to anyone who needs it, so if you are working within a certified electronic medical health record, you have access to these care plans with different uh, providers and practices. And it uses uh, the care plan in a system management uh, to determine supply and quality issues for the community. So the data that is collected from these care plans can actually be used uh, to improve uh, the, the delivery of care systems. Next step, I mean, I'm sorry, next uh, slide. I 
I think they're there we go so it's interesting as we look at what we're measuring uh, as we move forward and, and what really matters to individual people. And from the data, what we find is that what really, really matters to people with advanced uh, chronic diseases is that relationships, family, friends, and spirituality or worship, uh, they want control of their finances, they want dignity and respect, they want to maintain their independence, they want to stay home in their homes, uh, they like familiarity and meaningfulness and significance, they want comfort and the confidence that they can do what they want to do, and obviously good survival time or quality of life. But, but what, we're, uh, what do we measure right now uh, when we look at a couple of uh, um, requirements here? Next slide. If we look at what we measure in nursing homes, we currently measure uh, moderate to severe pain, uh, new or worsened pressure ulcers, and uh, the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research has done a lot of work uh, in this area. Um, whether or not a patient's had a flu or pneumococcal vaccine, and remember that the pneumococcal vaccine criteria has changed. You have one in your lifetime, and it's over the age of 65. We're no longer giving those at uh, uh, five and ten year intervals. Uh, also, any patients who are on antipsychotic medications, partly because of the anticholinergic effects of these medications and how they interfere with other medications, the need for ADL help, weight loss, uh, any issues with incontinence, bowel or bladder incontinence, urinary catheters, UTIs, uh, depression, restraints, falls with injury. So if we look at these measures, those are very different measures than what are meaningful and important to patients and families. Next slide. The current measures in home care include mobility, bathing, breathing, uh, wounds, um, patients and families having an understanding of their medications. They're also evaluated on how many times somebody from the care team makes a, a home visit whether or not uh, the emergency room or hospital admissions are being utilized, and the patient rating of overall care, the pr professionalism of the team coming in and the communication that they have between the team. And again, these measures are very different than what are meaningful and important to patient and family. Next slide. Just uh, two months ago, April 27th, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services issued a proposal to align and modernize how Medicare payments are tied to the cost and quality of patient care. Next slide. The CMS released this long-awaited uh, report that established the new quality payment program. And if anybody hasn't seen this uh, um, report, it's very impressive. Uh, you can locate it at the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and this framework provides the Merit Incentive uh, Payment System, which is also known as MIPS, and also the alternative payment models or the alternative um, advanced alternative payment models. Uh, these policies were established by the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, which is called MACRA. MACRA took over the 1997 Sustainable Growth uh, legislation that annually updated payment to physicians uh, based on the value or the volume versus the value, and that was totally taken away uh, last year. So the new legislation is MACRA, and MACRA is driving these two new models of uh, reimbursement in the United States. Next slide. The proposed rule will provide a unified framework uh, called, and I just mentioned, the Quality Payment Program that includes the two unique path, the uh, MIPS or the Advanced Alternative Payment, eligible providers that include physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and certified registered nurse anesthetists are involved in these uh, payment uh, incentive programs, and our outcomes are all going to be transparent uh, on the federal uh, website. Next slide, please. The um, merit-based incentive payment system is primarily what most uh, providers and practices are going to be using. Um, CMS predicts that this is probably going to be used 70% of the time uh, for reimbursement for Medicare. Uh, 
what MIPS has replaced, and we've all, we were talking about physician equality reporting system that kicked off at the beginning of this year, as well as the value-based modifier program and meaningful use of electronic health records, all of those programs are now gone. And MIPS is now uh, the, the umbrella um, taking over uh, this area of reporting. Next slide. As I mentioned, uh, providers are going to have to be transparent. They will receive a composite score based on performance in each of the four categories. Again, these are all based on the measures uh, from the National Quality Forum. These quality measures are from the core domains and they're determined annually. Uh, the data is gained from the provider performance on these measures and all of this again comes through the certified CMS certified um, meaningful use electronic medical records. And then the data will be posted on the Physician Compare website. Next slide. The four performance categories include quality, uh, which is 50% of the total score in year one. This will begin, this is predicted to begin in January of 2017, so we only have six months before this starts. Quality is used to replace the PQRS and the value modifier. Um, and the quality is also generated from the use of evidence-based guidelines. I love the fact that this entire change in reimbursement is directly correlated with evidence-based practice guidelines. We've had willy-nilly practice out there. That's why we are the most expensive uh, practice in the world and we're equal to Pakistan in our outcomes. We're number 36 worldwide. Um, so the whole focus of changing the use of evidence and implementing science to standard care is really important. Uh, advancing care information, again, the use of electronic health record uh, is used here, and this is 25% of the total score. Clinical practice improvement activities is 15% of the total score. Uh, this is a new domain that was recently added by the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid. And then the cost of resource utilization, and that comes directly from CMS itself. There's no way that providers are going to be calculating their cost of care that will come from Medicare. So all of these four categories are going to be used to determine the score, uh, the MIPS score, for incentives, whether providers get money back for being above uh, the standard of care, or if they're below, they, they have to pay a penalty. Next slide. So the um, advanced alternative payment models, it's interesting to watch how this has changed over the past six years. The accountable care organizations seemed at, at first to be the big, um, you know, the big basket there were all the eggs were going to be placed for CMS this was the model of care that would make a difference um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Centers of Medicare Medicaid Innovation Awards all of the advanced alternative payment models that are at the Centers of Medicare Medicaid Innovation will be part of the demonstration in the country so it's a very important site Billions of dollars have gone into funding innovation through the Affordable Care Act, and if you haven't looked at it, I think you'll be amazed at what we have funded and what is underway, well underway, in the United States as we look at advanced alternative payment models. Next slide. So in these advanced alternative payment models, uh, under the macro requirements, uh, they have to, again, use a uh, CMS certified electronic medical record. Reimbursement, again, is based upon comp comparable quality measures and the use of evidence-based guidelines. Again, that's the implementation of the evidence. And, be and or becoming an enhanced medical home or reporting more than a nominal risk for losses. And I'll explain that in the next slide. So the advanced alternative payment models must provide CMS with a clear thesis on what measures that they plan to test. And these are groups of providers, right, that work in a community to try to reduce the care of patients within that community. Um, and CMS will require a formal agreement between the providers and the um, APM. Uh, the CMS will work individually with each advanced alternative payment model to evaluate and assess the, sp the specific measurements, again, the measurements from the National Quality Forum, and CMS will provide the transparency to the public. Uh, so whether you're using the MIPS reimbursement um, path or you're using the advanced alternative payment model path, 
<clears throat> the providers are still required to be transparent on whether or not they're meeting their um, measurements. And this is also uh, going to start January 1st, 2017. Next slide. My references, you can move forward. There we go. Um, if, if there's any questions, um, what's happening in the country is absolutely amazing. It's changing everything that we've been familiar with, and none of us have ever seen a tsunami of this magnitude uh, hit U.S. healthcare. And learning to understand it and to fashion your practice and be prepared to hit the ground running when you graduate is going to be very important. And if there's any questions, I'll take them now. All right, I will wait to see if there are any questions. I, if you do have any questions on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a questions chat box. Please, please feel free to type your questions in there. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any questions. Um, Dr. Keebler, I'd really like to thank you for presenting to us tonight. I think you brought a lot of great information, um, and I think that it's very relevant. Oh, it looks like we just got a question. Um, how are healthcare outcomes equally measured between providers? Well, every provider has an opportunity to decide which measurements that they want to use in their practice. So not all providers are going to be using the same measurements. Um, you know, you have 300 measures to select from and you know, you have to put eight of those measurements into your practice. Quality is uh, one of them that you have to have, so they're actually wanting to see that um, practices are using evidence-based practice guidelines, but there is no comparison between one or the other. The practices and individuals are going to be measured based upon meeting their specific, requir their specific measurements that they embedded into the uh, Meaningful Use Certified Electronic Medical Records. So, not all medical records are certified, so that's really important to understand too, that you have to have a health record that is, is partnered with CMS to be able to collect those uh, measurements. Okay, we also have another question for you, Dr. Keebler. How are private practitioners being prepared for this change? should be prepared. Um, this has been coming down the line for six years. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies, big companies that have gotten out there and offering tremendous support. Um, McKesson, you know, they have the medical records to actually and the consultants to help people figure out which measures they need to have in their electronic medical records and how to start capturing data. Um, uh, other ones, uh, Athena Health, um, they have webinars that they offer all the time. You know, you can get on the listservs at the federal level. I am on every listserv you can imagine to stay current and up to date. And it takes somebody to really be looking at this uh, to stay on top of it. So you either can do it yourself or you can hire a consultant to help you um, be prepared. And we have six months. So if you're not doing this in 2017, you're going to be gravely affected by it in 2019 because all of the um, payment structures are going to be taken from 2017 data and used in 2019. Well, it does look like all of the questions that we have for you. Um, Dr. Keebler, once again, thank you so much for doing this for us.
priority for us. Um, this information is, is super relevant moving forward, and I know that it's going to affect a lot of nurses out there um, and a lot of healthcare professionals. So um, to everyone who attended, thank you so much for attending tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this session has been recorded, and it will be made available to you on the South University YouTube channel for your future re reference. So again, thank you so much. It was a fantastic presentation, and I hope that everyone has a great night. Thank you.